Good evening. I call the regular board meeting to order. All board members are present. Mr. LeMay, would you lead us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be advised that in the event of a fire emergency and an evacuation should be necessary, an alarm will sound. Please note all marked emergency exits and evacuate well away from the building. This time we request that everyone turn their cell phones and other electronic devices to silent. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Dr. Renator, thank you. Second? Mr. LeMay? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. We'll now have our board recognition, Dr. Mertzla. Thank you, Mrs. Leatherbarrel. Tonight we are proud to recognize four of our outstanding teachers who recently were named to the New York State Master Teacher Program. This elite program targets innovative STEM teachers from across the state who are committed to their students and who are enthusiastic about ongoing professional development and sharing best teaching practices with their colleagues. Our newest master's teachers represent four Williamsville schools, and I would like to invite Dr. Balin to introduce them to us tonight. Dr. Balin? Thank you, Dr. Mertzloff. Good evening. Donna Callahan serves as the math specialist at Forest Elementary, where she has taught for the past 23 years. For much of the time, she had spent part administrative duties, and now she teaches math full-time to second, third, and fourth grade classes. She also provides academic intervention to students in kindergarten and first grade. Mrs. Callahan chairs the school's math committee and conducts monthly professional development classes to help her fellow teachers explore new strategies for teaching math. She also runs several popular student clubs, including the Lego Club, a hands-on equation club, and a bedtime math club. Ron Perry is the K-4 through math specialist at Heim Elementary, where he has worked for the past 11 years. When he was first hired in the district, he began in a dual role as both teacher and part-time administrator. He is now the co-teacher in a third grade classroom and instructs math across all grade levels. He is a member of both building and district level math committees. He teaches professional development and is a presenter at local conferences. As a master teacher, he looks forward to becoming part of a professional learning community focused on best practices, and his dream is to develop the ultimate math intervention handbook that would close the gap for struggling students. Elizabeth Spada has been teaching in Williamsville for six years and currently teaches Regents Chemistry and Living Environment at East High School. She has been the co-advisor for East Science Olympiad team and also serves as the co-advisor for the Comic Book Club. She has presented professional development, she has field tested classroom resources, and she has also participated in the NYSED Environmental Conservation Green Chemistry Initiative. She is a strong advocate for wildlife and volunteers weekly at the SPCA. She is passionate about nurturing a love for science among girls and hopes the Master Teacher Program will help her find new avenues to get more girls interested in STEM. Mr. Michael Dunlop, who wasn't able to join us tonight, has been teaching science for 16 years at North High School. He currently teaches honors physics, regions physics, general physics, and academic intervention for earth science. He serves as the textbook manager at North, maintains the greenhouse, and has been on numerous committees over the years. He looks forward to learning how to improve his lessons and rewrite labs into the argument-driven inquiry format. So tonight I'd like to invite up uh, Ms. Callahan, Mr. Perry, and Ms. Spada to make some comments. Good evening. I would just like to thank the Board of Education as well as the district for their support in mathematics education. The ability to share with my colleagues to attend conferences, book studies, um, professional development has been unprecedented to any district that I know of. 
And because of that, I think it stands to say you have four teachers who have made it into the New York State uh, Master Teacher Program. So thank you, and another huge thank you to Forest Elementary. I couldn't ask for a better staff to work with. Um, Mr. Wing and Dr. Balin, and a huge thank you to Mr. Dr. Chris McGinley. Chris goes above and beyond finding the materials and the resources and the training to help us. And it really shows in our students and in our faculties, our teachers, we've been able to grow right along with the students. So thank you to all of you. Okay. Hi, I'm Libby Sveda. Um, I think you guys just heard I teach at East High School. Um, and you know, I'm really, really excited at the opportunity to be a part of the New York State Master Teacher Program. Um, I've really been blessed to work in the Williamsville Central School District. When I first got out of college, right around 2010, 2011, um, it was kind of hard to get a, a teaching job at that time. And it, it took a little bouncing around, but I feel so blessed that I landed at East. Um, I've had, you know, extremely supportive administration that even, you know, supported me through getting uh, I guess the offer to be in the New York State Master Teacher Program. I have been blessed with colleagues who also really encouraged me to apply um, and you know have become dear friends of mine as well. And most importantly to me, um, I get to work with some of the best kids that I think Western New York has to offer. So I'm really excited to be a part of the Master Teacher Program, mostly because I am excited to bring back things for them, things that'll get them excited, get them inspired, and and things that I'll enjoy doing in the classroom with my kiddos. But thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to um, echo a lot of the comments that have been made already. Um, when I transitioned um, to Williamsville 11 years ago, um, and I was in a dual role um, seeking after administrative work, um, I had um, math duties still um, to work so I was in a dual role still in that dual role next year will be my first year when um, my position splits and I've chosen to be a full-time math teacher because um, I really I, I appreciated the opportunities that I've had from this district um, and it's kind of recharged my teaching soul and um, I'm excited. I appreciate being recognized, but I'm honored to be a master teacher representing Williamsville School District. Um, and from, from the board, Dr. Martzloff, Dr. Balin, um, Dr. Stafford, um, Chris McGinley, Dr. McGinley, and um, a good friend of ours, um, Eileen Ryan, have really um, inspired me and allowed me to, to be the best that I can be now. And I look forward to um, the master teacher program and what Donna and I can bring to back to the elementary schools and um, and see where we can go with math here in Williamsville. So thank you very much. Just in closing, I'd like to offer our um, collective congratulations to these fine professionals. What they bring to our children each and every day is outstanding. So thank you uh, to our, our teachers, and congratulations again.
And I just have to go back for a moment. I realize I did not make the motion to return to executive session. So can I get a, a motion to return from executive session to regular session? Dr. Renator, thank you. And Mr. LeMay, second. All in favor? Thank you. Um, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Carey. We will um, now check on board acknowledgments. Do we have any board acknowledgments tonight? Seeing none, we will now move on to public expression. Dr. McCleary, would you please read the board's public expression statement? Welcome to all who have come to observe this regular board meeting. Per policy 1510, the board has set aside 30 minutes for public expression, a time when we invite members of the community to share ideas and concerns with us. We welcome this opportunity to hear from you. Each person is given up to three minutes in which to address the board. You will be signaled with a yellow flag at two and a half minutes so that you may conclude your remarks for those last um, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. This is a meeting held in public rather than a public meeting, which means we will not be engaging in a dialogue with members of the community this evening. Rest assured, we are listening carefully and we take seriously what you have to say. I would also like to ask that you demonstrate respect for us and for one another by speaking to the issues, giving us ideas, sharing your opinion, but not engaging in any personal attacks. Thank you for your cooperation. Our first speaker this evening is Christian, I'm sorry, Kristen Cacciati. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for your time and your service to our students here in Williamsville. I'm sure that this is one of those jobs that requires a lot more time and energy than any one of us out here can imagine. So thank you. Um, I sent an email to all of you about two weeks ago expressing my concerns about the current class sizes and the district class size guidelines. And I'm here today to voice my concerns in person. When my oldest daughter started kindergarten in 2015, I remember counting the name tags on supply drop off day and being thrilled that there were less than 20 students in her class. I know that there was an initiative to lower kindergarten first and second grade class sizes and I am appreciative of these changes. I am also aware that the reductions that started in 2015 were supposed to continue into upper grades but have not. My oldest daughter is now in fourth grade and I'm troubled by the numbers that I'm seeing. I feel that beginning in grade three, the guidelines are too high. For those that are listening or watching, the class side guide size guidelines in grade three are 22 to 26 students. In grade four, the class size guidelines are 23 to 27 students. During these upper elementary grades, the expectations and academic rigor is increasing. These students are experiencing state testing for the first time. In addition to these high guidelines, we are starting the year towards the top end of these guidelines. In fourth grade at Heim, we started our year with little room for growth. We had room for five students to transfer in before we would be over the district guidelines. Now we have a class at 28, which is over the district guidelines. Academics aside, it is 2019. Students are coming to school with more, more adverse childhood experiences, more trauma and more social emotional needs. We are asking too much of these teachers by having these large class sizes. Another thing that we need to take into account is that we have a new development being built off of Campbell Boulevard within the Heim school boundaries. There will be 133 houses built in the next two to three years. 22 of these houses are already sold and will be ready in the next four to five months. Where are these students going to go? I know that enrollment was looked at throughout the summer, but was this new housing development taking, taken into consideration? What is our plan going forward? These houses are family homes that most certainly will include children. I'm here tonight to advocate not just for my kids, but for all the kids in the Williamsville School District. As an educator, I know that class size does matter and the research shows it. We need to do everything in our power to increase student achievement and give them the foundational skills that they need going forward. 
I'm looking forward to starting this conversation now so that we can make adjustments for next year. We're not asking for major changes. Lowering the district guidelines to under 25 will make a significant impact on all of our children's future. Our kids deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jennifer Blazak. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Blazak. I'm a parent of a third grader at Heim and a sixth grader at Casey. I'm here today to voice my concern over the Williamsville District Guidelines for class sizes. I'm a high school math teacher in another district. I see such a value in small class sizes. In my district is against our contract to have classes above 26 students. I currently teach six classes. One class is 24. My other five classes are 20 students or less. My sixth grader at Casey is in a math class with 30. Uh, she's in a Spanish class with 29. I believe all students need to feel a connection at school and to feel safe there. These young people need to feel connected to their peers as well as adults in the school. Small class sizes are a way to help students feel safe and cared for. Young people today have a ton of pressures from social media and vaping and drugs. As a teacher with a small class size, I'm better able to notice the student who doesn't seem to have friends and help them make connections. I can more hear, easily hear inappropriate comments and react to them in an appropriate way and make sure students stay on task. When students feel connected to adults in their building, they are more comfortable letting an adult know their family can't afford the internet at home and we can work together with administration to get a hotspot to help them with schoolwork at home. Students are more comfortable asking questions about vaping or academics or school violence in smaller class settings. Our children have a lot on their plate and they need people in their lives that they feel safe asking questions from. They need connections. Teachers and students have less distractions in smaller class sizes. Less energy is spent on monitoring behavior and more energy can be used to plan and run group activities and other informal assessments. Many students have childhood trauma and many people know nothing about what's going on in their lives. They don't ha some students don't have many trusted adults in their lives at home and it's at school where they can find them. I believe elementary students benefit greatly from small class sizes but I also feel, it, it feel it's extremely important for our big kids too. Even though some of the high school kids are as tall as adults, they still need the support and comfort from our staff. Please don't forget the older kids. Kids in every district deserve the best education. And I hope Williamsville will make a commitment to smaller class sizes by lowering the district guidelines in all grades three through 12. I spoke during the community forum before 2015, and I hope that class size will be visited for the final time this year. Thank you for all you do for our children. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Swatin Ramakanishan. Not even close, I assume. I'm sorry. Almost. That's okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's totally fine. You were almost close. So. <laughs> yeah, close. so good evening. My name is Swati, and I'm here today to bring up the issue of school transportation. My son is a kindergartner at Maple West and goes to JCC for the after-school program. As parents entering into the new school system for the first time, we called uh, the transportation office over the summer and were ensured that our child would not be on the bus for more than 20 minutes that includes the bus transfer in the afternoon on the we were relieved to know that there is a my bus app where we can track the bus as it goes along in the morning and the afternoon which really helps us keep track keep on keep track on time especially in the morning and on the website it shows that my child should read jcc at 3 30 p.m we are two weeks into october and not once has he reached on time most of the times, he reaches between 3.45 and 4 p.m., which is an hour after school has ended. And two particular incidents have really raised the concern levels for us. On September 16th, when I logged into the app, the bus was on a completely different route at 3.45 p.m., an hour after the school had been dismissed. 
when I called the transportation office, I was told that the, there was a substitute driver who forgot to stop at the daycare. I thankfully mailed the transportation office and Mr. Graham Violini had a prompt reply and he said that he would look into this matter. My child, who's five years old, reached at 4.20 p.m. at JCC that day. On October 4th, which was an early dismissal day for Maple West, the dismissal time was 2.35 p.m. And yet, my child reached JCC at 3.50 p.m., an hour and 20 minutes into the bar, uh, after dismissal. This is really concerning because these are kids who are on the bus for longer than an hour. Um, having made multiple calls to the transportation office who are probably tired of hearing my voice and um, JCC who has called on our behalf multiple times, we were told that the system would be, or the issue would be resolved, but nothing has been, we haven't seen any improvements yet. And having talked to multiple parents, we have seen that this is a similar issue that kids face throughout the district. I'm here today to bring this issue to your notice and understand what the problem is and in the hope that moving forward that there is a solution to this issue. So thank you for your time and listening to me. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Stephanie Evans. Hello, um, I was here last month and um, to talk about transportation and I have not heard anything, so I came back. Um, my son is, Zachary is a fifth grader at Transit and the transportation department wants to pick him up on the corner of Klein and Bra Bradfield um, and there's no sidewalks. So in my opinion, it's not a safe location, in particular in the winter when it snows. Um, they said that they were only responsible for the child's safety while they're on the bus. So it's my responsibility before and after he's on the bus. Meanwhile, they're the ones determining where the location is. So um, I hope <coughs> that I hear from somebody soon. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jin Feng. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I come to offer my thanks. I know that uh, you are volunteers and it's a tremendously difficult job. So I come before you because we have a very, uh, we have like over decade long effort to expand the foreign language program to include Chinese teaching. So uh, last year finally, uh, we were able to move this forward and then that results in the approving uh, of the budget. And then finally, we spent many rounds of recruiting. Uh, I heard that uh, we're successful finally in uh, uh, actually identifying a teacher. I really hope that uh, this whole thing can move forward so that we have the ability to offer our kids a uh, world-class education. I know that there are many, many issues facing us, facing the community, but the uh, most important purpose of our school is educate. So uh, this is really the first and foremost. Uh, we have a lot of priorities, we have a lot of uh, uh, concerns. I know it's a very difficult task, and I'm here to offer our support uh, in terms of uh, uh, increasing the budget, in, in terms of supporting teachers, I think that uh, our community is fully behind you because we understand that when our, uh, when our school becomes better, our community becomes more attractive, it will uh, result in uh, people wanting to move into this uh, very nice community so we can build the ecosystem to be a much better uh, sort of environment. So I really uh, would like to offer my thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, Elizabeth Laporta. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I have three children in the school district, um, m almost. My daughter is a fourth grader um, at High Elementary School. I have a daughter in kinder, no, in first grade this year, and I have a three-year-old that will soon be in the district. And so I'm also here to support um, some of my fellow friends who've talked to you about class sizes. 
Um, it's become very concerning to me that my fourth grader is in a class of 27 students this year. Um, I visited her classroom recently and it is very crowded in there. I'm also a teacher. I teach in the Kenmore Town of Tonawanda School District. Um, my, my biggest class is 24 students and that class really feels big to me. Um, I teach eighth grade so my students are more self-sufficient than fourth graders and even that um, it's a lot of students in one room. I know that teachers in this district try to use innovative um, techniques for getting their students to learn and that means getting up out of your seats, it means moving around. Um, and I know that that's very hard to do when you have that many students in a room. The way the teacher has to design her desks to fit in the room, it's one big long table and they're all crammed together. And so my daughter is one in a sea of 27 faces. Um, when I moved to this district, I knew I was moving to a good district for my children. I wanted to give them the best chance. Um, you know, we pay the taxes knowing that our students are getting a great education and I think that Williamsville can do better than this. I think we can lower these numbers. Um, in my district, I am on the champion team for our trauma-informed care. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with UB in a three-year study. Um, and that's something that I know that you probably all know and you could research about trauma-informed care and the data that goes along with it. But what hits home for me is how students feeling a part of their school, feeling safe in their school, emotionally safe, and getting that emotional education as well as you know their academics, it's going to prevent bad choices in the future. It's going to give them a better chance. Um, and so that investment in our students is gonna come back to reward us in the long run. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Prashant Singh. Hello everybody, um, I'm here um, to again talk about the transportation. My daughter is a first grader at Country Parkway. Last year when she was in kindergarten, she goes to Y for after school program. So she used to take a transport bus at Forest. <coughs> and then she will reach Y by 3.35, 3.30. School ends at 2.45. So it was fine, no problem. This year, She's going again to Y after school, but then now the transport is at Maple East, and now the buses run anytime they reach, she reaches between, anytime between 3.40 to 4.15. And the other, the, the problem is, obviously the buses are getting delayed, kids are sitting on the bus for a long time, but sometimes the bus goes to YMCA and the kids sit in the bus for 10 minutes at Y, because the Y staff doesn't know when the bus is going to show up. It's just times are so variable that it's creating problem for everybody that even why people can't follow when the bus is going to show up. Um, if you allow me, I can show you this map which basically tracks the, where the bus goes and seems like <laughs> the kids are getting the bus tour of Williamsville Village. For, I don't know why. Because last year when the bus was transferring at Forest, there was two stops before why. This time I even can't, cannot count how many stops they're taking and why. These are first grade kindergarten students. You can't keep them on the bus for over an hour without no bathrooms or anything. So I'm just you know, here to raise my concern like uh, Swati, just to keep our kids safe and don't have any accidents on the bus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Deanna. Ramito. Thank you for hearing us tonight. Um, I have a son in seventh grade at High Middle and my daughter is in the largest fourth grade class at High Elementary. Um, I do want to take a minute to note that her teacher is wonderful. He does everything that he can as one person with 28 kids and I believe the whole fourth grade team I would say that about. Uh, I just wanted to add to what the other ladies addressed. Uh, and say that obviously it would not be ideal to add another teacher at this point, so it's not what we're asking for. Um, but I would, I hope that this does start, start a discussion on what can be done this year to support those teachers and those students in those large classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next is Karina Paleochi. Paolucci better. That's fine. <laughs> um, my name is Karina Pellucci. 
Uh, I have two middle schoolers at High Middle. I was at Heim Elementary, uh, and I am here to support the Heim Elementary parents who are talking about the class sizes. Many of you I met about four years ago, and I was having this exact conversation, this exact same conversation. They had 28 kids in that fourth grade, and we all agreed. I remember the moment when the president of the board turned to Dr. Marksloff and said, are there really 28 kids in those classrooms? He didn't even know. Um, now we have to start talking about reducing those guidelines because we get into this gray area where you have the numbers. I was impressed to see that you were even talking about class sizes at all at the beginning of this year and you had your spreadsheet and you saw that there were 26 kids. That was the average for that fourth grade and 27 is the top guideline number. I'm concerned that there was no talk of adding a teacher at that time knowing that those class sizes are gonna grow, and now we have one of those at 28 and we're six weeks into the school year. Um, I think the answer is to change those guidelines so that you no longer have these gray areas. 27, 26 is too many. I had a third grader with 26. That was too many for him. Um, the change between 26 students and 22 students from third grade to fourth grade when we actually did add a teacher was remarkable. Um, I think it's worth noting that changing those guidelines, that I do believe that this conversation, I think you can take care of it once and for all if you were to just change those guidelines. And that is a board function. Changing those guidelines is a board function. Um, adding teachers, I understand, is not a board function but I do think that we can change those guidelines and have a conversation about that so that going forward, we are protecting our youngest students um, and putting them in a position where they can be successful emotionally, academically, socially, which I think is what we all want for these kids. I don't think we want anything less than that. Um, and so that is why I'm here to support my friends who are at the elementary school and to hopefully continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. We've reached the end of the list of people who have signed up, but we have not reached our 30 minute initial limit. If there's anyone else in the audience who would like to address the board, you may do so at this time. Being none, then uh, this is the end of public expression, number one. Thank you to everyone who came and spoke tonight. And now we are moving on to our in external auditor presentation. Dr. Mertzloff, would you like to introduce the external auditor? Uh, yes, uh, th this time I'll turn it over to Mr. Matursky, who will introduce our external auditor, who will give our uh, report to the full board. Mr. Matursky. Thank you, Dr. Mertzloff. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Mr. Carl Widmer. He represents the firm of Gresham Malecki, who performed the um, annual audit. Uh, he will be presenting information concerning the results of this audit. Good evening, board. Thank you for the introduction. Um, here tonight to present an audit summary for the external audit of the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2019. I believe each of you are provided with a copy of the presentation. Um, just a short slideshow to facilitate a quick overview of the audit process. We did meet earlier with members of the audit committee to go over in a little bit more detail the audit process. Um, it was a, a very productive meeting, but tonight just want to um, present a quick overview of how the audit went to the entire board. So if you care to look forward. The presentation, the products of our audit, at the end of each audit, you can expect the financial statements. And in addition to the financial statements, you also have a couple communications, one being the management letter. In that letter, we'll, we'll include some recommendations or best practices that we've seen at other clients of ours that we think would be beneficial to the Williamsville School District. Um, just to consider some different accounting practices and other items that we think may, may improve this district. Also, there is an extra classroom activity report. That's a, a little financial statement package that reports on the extra classroom 
activities and clubs and programs that are run throughout the district. Next up, some audit communications. As I mentioned before, we did go over these in, in detail at the audit committee, but there are a couple that I wanted to highlight for, for the entire group. And the first is our responsibility as external auditors and to sort of clarify why we're hired and what, what function we serve to the district. And that is that we're hired to perform an independent review of the financial statements. So the balances right at June 30th and also the activity for the 12 months they're ending. Um, those numbers are maintained and managed by the district management throughout the year. And we're hired to come in and assess risk over the different financial cycles at the district, design tests to gain comfort over those amounts, and ultimately to provide our opinion on whether we believe those financial statements fairly present the financial position of the district at June 30th, 2019. Um, we did come to that opinion that the financial statements are fairly stated. And the other audit communication that I want to include tonight to the entire group is perhaps the most important piece. And if we're hired as your external auditors and users of the financial statements, whether it be your taxpayers and residents, banks, granting agencies, or the bond market, they, they look to the external audit for that, that unbiased third-party opinion that those financial statements can be relied upon. So it's imperative that we're independent from the district as your external auditor. So I can verify tonight, um, both in fact and appearance, myself and all members of the firm, we are independent from the district. There aren't any conflicts of interest. Um, so it, it puts us in the right position to perform the external audit for you. The next slide will go over a, a quick overview, a focus on the general fund of the district for the fiscal year. And if referred to slide three, there's a, a line graph here of the past five years of the revenue and expenditure activity. And what you see for the fiscal year ended 1819 is that revenues and expenditures both increased from the prior year and they increased to the point where they almost met each other this year. So on a budget that's approaching $200 million or in the 190 millions, um, to come within $400,000, pretty close. So overall, as, as a result of revenues of 185 million and change, exceeding spending of about 185 million, your fund balance grew or improved about $400,000 for the fiscal year. Next slide, we, we present the fund balance, and essentially this is your equity position or where those results, the revenues and expenditures, got you at the end of the year. So total fund balance is at $73.6 million. This first slide on fund balance um, on page four is split between restricted and unrestricted funds. So GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards, they provide that the fund balance of the district be segregated into different levels or classifications based on how readily available the district is able to tap into those funds. I'm sure you're familiar with the fund balance restrictions. You know, there are certain purposes for which how you can fund those amounts and also how you can spend from them. That's your red portion here, and that's 56.6 million of the total. The 16.9 million is referred to as unrestricted, and on the next slide, we look into that section a little bit deeper to which it includes a signed fund balance of 9.2 million and the remaining 7.7 .7 million is considered your unassigned fund balance. That's a number that your, your most casual <coughs> financial statement readers are going to hone in on and compare that to other districts along with the restrictions and the reserves that you maintain on hand. They're going to be concerned with how much money is left in the unassigned or the available fund balance and what can that be used for. That unassigned fund balance of 7.7 .7 million, on the next slide, the last graphical slide, page six here, is subject to real property tax law. Uh, if you've been through an audit process before, you may be familiar with real property tax law 1318, which dictates the unassigned fund balance that the district may not exceed 4% of the next year's budgeted spending. Um, Williamsville <coughs> District is in compliance with this requirement as their unassigned fund balance represents 3.95%. Uh, 
So overall, um, as a comparison from prior year, I'd say the district maintained its reserves positions. Um, also, their unassigned fund balance maintained at the levels they were while keeping in compliance with real property tax law. So a, a solid financial performance for the year. Overall observations on the audit, I can communicate tonight that there were no reportable findings. Um, that meaning no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control. If there were any of those items, we'd communicate those to you. Um, another item that's included in the external audit is a special compliance review over the federal awards or the federal aid that the district receives. Um, once you reach a certain level, you're subject to what's called a single audit, and it's a special compliance audit that we perform over your federal programs. Um, as a result of that testing, there were also no reportable findings, so I want to communicate that tonight. I referenced before a management letter that would contain some best practices or recommendations. There are a few housekeeping items in, in that letter. Um, I believe that you'll be shared if you haven't already been a, a copy of that letter. But one of them includes an item over cybersecurity and training your, the employees throughout the district on both how to prevent, but also what the protocol would be in the event um, a virus or attack was, was sustained by the district. And another item is regarding a cash management policy, which is more passed down from the federal government and will be looked at in that single audit, compliance audit, for next fiscal year. So just a, a, a heads up on that item. Finally, we receive full cooperation from everybody at the district. Uh, this is a, certainly an efficient audit. We appreciate having Williamsville District as a client. Um, we, we get along very well with their staff, and I, I know my audit team enjoys working on this, on this job. So whatever you're doing here, keep it up. Um, it's going well. If there are any questions at this time, be happy to try and answer them for you. Otherwise, I think we're prepared to, we're in a position to release the financial statements. Um, there is a, an October 15th deadline that the district likes to reach, and I, I believe we'll be in a position to submit following this meeting. So thank you for your time, and thank you for the opportunity to work for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board members, we will now move on to our consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? Nine, personnel, 10, business, and 11, special needs and student activities as presented. Mrs. Beeger, thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Mecca, thank you. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Extensions, motion carried unanimously. I would like to thank the following retirees for their service to the district. Chester Zubinski, district-wide grounds worker, 27 years and 10 months of service. And Kathleen Bornesiro, facilities account clerk typist, 27 years and 10 months of service. Thank you for your service. Moving on to the approval of last month's minutes. Is there a motion to approve the September 17th regular board meeting minutes? Mr. LeMay, thank you. Second, Dr. McClary. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. President's report. The Williamsville Central Schools Education Foundation will host the Wall of Fame Breakfast on Friday, November 8th at 8 a.m. I will be attending along with Mr. Borenstein and Mr. LeMay. The Erie County Association of School Boards, ECASB, held a legislative team meeting on Thursday, September 19th. Dr. McCleary attended this meeting. Do you wish to, re to give a report at the table? I had submitted a report, so I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. On Thursday, October 10th, there was a budget and finance meeting. 
Mr. Mecca, do you wish to give a report? Um, I believe I had, a, <coughs> excuse me, I believe I had a conflict that evening. Oh, um, sorry about that. I think, I think that we had a special meeting that night, right? Oh, that's correct. We were here. You're in touch. You can't be in two places. Okay, sorry about that. Legislative team meeting for um, Erie County Association of School Boards. The next meeting will happen on Thursday, October 17th. Mr. Mecca is going to make that one. Hopefully. I have a conflict that night. Um, Maple West PTA uh, is scheduled at the same exact time, so I, I sent an email while we were sitting at the table to see if anyone is available to cover me at either of the two events. State your honesty. It's your choice. All right. Whichever one you want. Well, let's see if we can get the next one here. Albany Update event, Thursday, November 7th um, for Erie Wimboses. Thursday, November 7th. Mr. Mecca, do you, are you able to attend that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The Albany Update event, Thursday, November 7th at Erie One Boces. Yes, I think I'm going to that. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Does anyone have anything else to report under Erie County Association of School Boards? Thank you. Moving on to NISPA, our New York State School Board Association. The 100th annual NISPA convention will be taking place Thursday, October 24th through Saturday, October 26th. This year's convention will take place in Rochester, New York. Attending listed is Mr. Borenstein, Mr. LeMay, Dr. McCleary, and Mr. Meyer. The pre-convention communications workshop will be attended by Dr. McCleary, and I believe our superintendent will be joining as well. Special feature this year, Mr. LeMay and Dr. McCleary will be presenters at this year's convention, and their session will be called School Board, Are You Listening? Thank you, Dr. McCleary and Mr. LeMay for agreeing to be presenters at this year's convention. Now we will take a look at the 2019 bylaws, amendments, and resolutions. Four board members have been registered to attend the convention in, Washington, in, in Rochester on October 24th through 26th. Mr. LeMay will serve as our delegate. Mr. Meyer will serve as the alternate. Mr. Borenstein and Dr. McCleary will also be attending. You have been given the proposed bylaw amendments and resolutions. Does anyone wish to comment on any of the amendments or rebuttals to the proposed amendments and resolutions? Dr. McClary. And I apologize, I opened my folder to, to find the uh, sheet and it's not there. But at last month's meeting, we brought up a discussion that uh, the Erie County Association of School Boards had recommended that our delegate um, not vote as was being recommended in the packet. And so I just wanted to bring back up, hopefully other people remember what there, I believe there were two or three, two items. Mr. LeMay, can you expand sure. on that, please? There were two resolutions that were not recommended by the resolution committee for adoption. The first one was resolution number 21, uh, opposing lowering the age of eligibility for commercial driver license required to be a school bus driver from 21 to 18. And then resolution 22, uh, to allow retired law enforcement officers to work in public schools as security guards, directors of security, or supervisors of security without effect on their pension and without pension waivers, if that helps. Yes, thank you. And I believe that, as I said, that the Erie County Association of School Boards had suggested that we speak with our delegate and make our views known of whether we felt that uh, we would ask you not to vote the way New York State is asking you to vote. Any further discussion on that? Thank you, Dr. McClary, for bringing that up. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion to resolve to authorize our delegate and alternate to vote as they deem appropriate for our school district after they have heard all discussions regarding the issues presented. 
Mr. Maka, thank you. Second? Meyer. Uh, Mr. Meyer, <laughs> why am I doing this? Mr. Meyer, thank you, second. Mrs. Beeger, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. Does anyone have anything else to report under NISPA? Thank you. <clears throat> right, Board of Education school building visits. I believe Mrs. Carey has sent out um, a list of our visits. I followed it up with an email today just asking everyone to please take a second look because some of our um, upcoming dates are a little light on board member attendance. So if any other board members are able to attend, it would very much be appreciated. But we do have a few upcoming school build, building visits. Our first one is going to be on Friday, November 1st at Maple West. Right now we have Mr. LeMay, Mr. Mecca is a maybe, Mrs. Van Seitz was a maybe, and myself. Does anyone wish to speak on that? Mr. Mecca? I can move into the confirmed pile. Thank you. I can also. Thank you, Mrs. Van Seitz. Mr. Mecca and Mrs. Van Seitz confirmed that they can attend. Thank you. On Monday, November 18th, we have a, a visit at South High School. This is at 7 a.m. Uh, board members attending so far are Mr. LeMay and myself. I would love to get a few more board members there since teachers are getting up bright and early to greet us in the cafeteria. It's nice to have a reason to show up at 7 a.m. Is anyone else able to attend at this time? Great. On Friday, December 6th, we have a visit at Transit Middle School in the cafeteria at 8 a.m. Also during that visit so far, it's Mr. LeMay and myself. I realize that's not until December, so perhaps um, something might open up. I'm going to leave that December 16th North visit also as a, as a maybe perhaps by the November meeting, something might open up for someone. Moving on to our community forums, we are having a community forum, the first one of the year, on Saturday, November 2nd. This will be at North High School in the cafeteria from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Attending, we have Mr. LeMay, Dr. McClary, Mr. Mecca was listed as a maybe, Mrs. Van Seis, and Mrs. Beaker. I am able to attend at 10 a.m. I will be a little late coming from another event. Um, any confirmations on that? Yes, sir. I'm making commitments tonight. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mecca. Great. Are any other board members able to attend our first community forum? Mr. Meyer, is that one? I am. I will take uh, Mark's uh, maybe spot, so I'll fill that one. <laughs> Very right. good. That's awesome. I think Peppers. I'm already committed. Am I already committed. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Thank you. All right, our board retreat. So it's a little bit ahead, but Saturday, January 11th. First, I want to um, say that we did reserve a NISPA facilitator tentatively because we needed to take some action on that and have someone lined up to be a facilitator. We have a half day retreat that day. This is Saturday, January 11th, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I'm seeking confirmation on board member attendance at this time for the January 11th retreat. Please raise your hand if you can commit to attend the retreat on January 11th. I think Ms. Mrs. Carey, do you have us off? Thank you so much. So um, as I said, I did, we did, well actually Mrs. Carey, I wanna thank you. She made the contact with our NISPA facilitator. So we do have a facilitator reserved. However, we do not yet have a topic or a purpose for our retreat, which are always important. So would anyone like to make a suggestion for the topic or purpose of our winter retreat? NISPA has uh, several uh, sort of packaged retreats that they have listed. I'm gonna ask Mrs. Carey if you could send out those choices to board members again so we can take a look. And I believe we need to sort of narrow that down by our next meeting, at least have our topic. I'll send that out. Thank you so much. All right. Upcoming strategic planning committee meeting date. Our next strategic planning committee meeting date will be 
in the board conference room on Tuesday, October 29th. Mr. Borenstein and Dr. McCleary have agreed to be part of this strategic planning. And I just want to, again, acknowledge both Dr. McCleary and Mr. Borenstein for this commitment. I'm not sure if they knew what they were getting into when they signed up, but these are full day commitments that these board members um, attend these, these very important planning sessions. So thank you for that commitment. Superintendent's report, uh, our community update. Dr. Mark Block, would you like to give your community update, please? Thank you, Mrs. Leatherborough. Uh, as you mentioned, there is a, a community forum on Saturday, November 2nd. Uh, one of the things I'd ask the board to do once they're finishing dropping cups is to um, look at the possibility of making it uh, a focus on school safety and security uh, and really hearing from our parents and our community of what their ideas are very specifically as they relate uh, to safety and security in our schools. Uh, I think that's uh, critically important, particularly as we continue to plan uh, for a potential capital project that would reconfigure some of our main entrances to our schools uh, that we would put forward to our voters for potential approval uh, in May of 2020. Uh, so with that, it is important uh, that we get uh, input as to what those items might be. Uh, do we think we need more cameras? Do we need more school resource officers? What kinds of enhancements um, are parents thinking about when it comes to the safety and security of children? So we hope that people, that would be one topic, that's not the only topic of course, but it would be a opportunity to come out and uh, speak and have conversation with uh, myself and the board on that particular day. Uh, in regards to safety and security. Um, community update, the only other item I'll mention is today we had our consultants from PLC Learning uh, that came in and visited four of our schools and talked to groups of parents, educators, and also students uh, at each of uh, those four schools to get feedback on what they felt was going well, where some of the need areas are uh, within the district, and things of that nature to help us continue to work towards crafting our strategic plan uh, later this fall and into the winter. Uh, so that's all I have to report at this time. So uh, I look forward to sharing more at the next meeting. Thank you, Dr. Martla. At our last meeting, we reviewed several uh, board policies. Is there a motion to take the September 17th, 2019 motion from the table for a second reading and adoption of the following revised policies. Policy 5140, administration of the budget. 5660, meal charging and prohibi prohibition against meal shaming. 7260, designation of person in parental relation. 7511, immunization of students. 7512, students, physicals, and 7522, concussion management. Is there a motion to take that from the table? Dr. McCleary, thank you. And Mr. LeMay is a second. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. Is there a motion for the second reading and adoption of the following revised policies as mentioned before? 5140, 5660, 7260, 7511, 7512, 7522. A motion for the second reading and adoption of those policies. Dr. Renader, thank you. <coughs> second. Mrs. Mrs. Peeker, thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. Moving on to our <clears throat> finance items. Is there a motion to approve the 2020-2021 budget development calendar as presented in the packet? Borenstein, thank you. Mrs. Beeger, second. Is there any discussion on that calendar? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. Approval of the annual audit. 
Is there a motion to resolve to accept the report of the examination of the district's financial statements prepared by Drescher and Malecki, LLP, independent auditors for the fiscal school year, beginning on July 1st, 2018, and ending on June 30th, 2019, as presented? Mr. LeMay, thank you. Is there a second? Mrs. Beeger, is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried unanimously. If you have any liaison reports, please send them to Mrs. Carey. The list of meeting, doc meeting dates are in board docs. Since our last regular board meeting, has anyone attended a school event that you wish to report on? Great, I'd just like to say that I was able to attend um, the Dodge Country Fair. It was uh, last Friday, I believe. I think that was the fourth or the fifth. And I volunteered to collect the coats. They, they had a program where um, the students, you could buy a wristband for the students to have entry into the fair. And if you donated a coat to the homeless, you got half off your wristband. So we, I was working with some students at, at my outdoor station. We were all bundled up. We made a prediction at the beginning of the night of how many bags of coats we would fill. And the prediction was 12 bags by one of the students there. We actually filled 13 bags of coats. So I believe that's pretty dynamic for a pretty cold evening. So thank you, and I, I very much enjoyed that event. All right. Are there any legislative matters that anyone chooses? Teresa, if, if I may real quick, just Sorry. with respect to uh, liaison assignments, um, heads up to my fellow board members here. Uh, I'm going to need coverage for two upcoming um, meetings. Uh, so the Education Foundation has a meeting October 22nd at 8 a.m. I unfortunately have to be in court uh, that morning. And then on October 24th, SEPSA is going to be holding a meeting at 6.30, but I'll be at the NISBA convention. Um, but <clears throat> I think that one's in particular important to have someone covering because that's a new liaison assignment, and I think this will be their first uh, meeting, so I think it would be really nice to have a board member there. I'd, I'd be willing to cover the SEPSA meeting. On the Thank board. you, Mary. Thank you for teamwork. Is anybody else going to the Education Foundation breakfast? I'm attending the breakfast in November, but this was a meeting, you said, right? A different yeah, day. this is uh, one of their regular meetings. Okay. Um, it's it's early in the morning. I'm like, well, actually, you you were at transit. They meet yeah. they meet pretty early too. This will be at 8 a.m. here in district office. You don't have to commit right now if you don't want to. Um, Mr. Mayor, could you put that in an email to just to follow yeah, up? Yeah, no problem. None of us forget. Thank you so much. Any other school events that anyone wishes to report on or any liaison related matters? Thank you. Are there any legislative matters that anyone chooses to discuss tonight? Mr. Mecca. Yes. Um, Senate Education Chair Shelley Mayer is hosting a series of roundtables across the state in order to discuss the foundation aid formula. A few local superintendents and our executive director and the executive director of ECASB have been invited to give feedback at the Western New York event on October 18th. Anyone is welcome to attend and listen. It is at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in the, at, on Elm Street at the Zebro Family Conference Center um, from 10 in the morning until two in the afternoon. Um, they're asking for written input from all districts. Um, so the letter should come from the superintendent and if possible, co-signed by the board president and a few uh, other districts have included their business official as well as uh, signers and contributors to the letter. Um, there's an advocacy alert from ECASB on this issue. I'm just wondering if everyone gets that. Uh, I got it in the email. Did you all get that? Okay, perfect. I, I won't forward it to you or anything. Um, do, do we plan to uh, write a letter for this? I'm just curious about that. Does anyone have any? We are drafting uh, a letter uh, that would include um, that it would be coming from myself, Mr. Matursky, and Mrs. Leatherbarrow if the board approves. Do we, do we have to take a vote or we just nod our heads and say we approve? 
motion? Sure, I'll make a motion that we send the letter that Dr. Martzloff uh, was planning on working on. <laughs> Regarding the? Regarding the uh, foundation aid formula um, feedback requested by um, Senate Education Chair Shelley Meyer. Second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll keep it, keep it formal around here. Any discussion on that? I just want to say thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that email came through today to that. Yeah, yeah. I briefly had a chance to, to look at it, um, but I, I appreciate that Dr. Marsloff already being on top of that. Mrs. Speaker, did you have something to add? I'm sorry. I'm going to say the same thing, that I'm grateful you brought it to the table, and I'm glad that our district is, is working towards that. It's an important issue, and I'm glad we're a part of that conversation. Thank you. So on the motion that um, I go ahead and sign off on that letter as well, as Mr. Mecca has stated. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, motion carried. All right, we will now move on to our curriculum presentation, a student achievement outcomes presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Leatherbarrow. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Balin, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, who will present information as it relates uh, to our academic performance as a school district this past year. Thank you, Dr. Martzloff, and thank you to the board for the opportunity to present this information this evening. A number of our instructional specialists as well as our principals and teachers contributed to the development of the presentation. I wish to thank them for their contributions. As always, it's important for us to continue to keep in mind that no single measure or assessment comprises the totality of a student's educational experience. There are many ways in which student performance and progress are determined. Assessment should be both qualitative and quantitative. It is ongoing and certainly should be varied in terms of the format. Uh, most importantly, we know that assessment should be meaningful to convey student progress and to set goals for teaching and for learning. And of course, improving and enhancing students' experiences academically and for the whole child are always at the forefront. This evening, we will hear some information encompassing three through eight testing, regents, advanced placement, diplomas, and post-secondary plans of our students. We've also included some highlights, current efforts, and next steps, which are reflected in the presentation. We always like to begin with a, a bit of a, a context, and I want to note for you on the slide here, um, you will see some uh, district uh, numbers and uh, essentially uh, demographic information. Um, it's noteworthy uh, that from our point in time last year when we delivered this very same presentation, um, we have seen a steady growth in our English language learners. Um, the number you see on the screen there represents our active Ls. As you know, we also maintain um, well over 100 students who are at the commanding level. Uh, we service them as well, so they're not represented in the number here, but just to give you a sense of the increase that we have seen at the time of this presentation last year, our number was 359, and the year before, 326. So um, certainly some steady growth there. The same holds true for our free and reduced lunch where we also saw some increases over last year. Um, here you uh, begin to see some uh, grade three through eight ELA and math um, information. We start first with our enrollment and the percentage of students who are tested. Um, on the screen, you will see enrollment figures recorded by New York State, as well as the percentage of the students tested relative to the total student enrollment. This is utilized for both state and federal purposes, as you are aware. Um, as far as non-tested st students, they actually fall into six categories, student refusals, medically excused, administrative errors, non-valid scores, and incomplete or no assessments. So in the next uh, four slides, you'll actually see several bar graphs. Uh, they're situated similarly. The first two are for ELA and the second two for math. What I'll ask you to please note or pay attention to are the dark green and the blue graphs. Um, you'll notice some terminology there that the board has inter been introduced to before, and these are 
categories uh, that are from New York State. They're called need resource categories. They, on this particular screen, you'll see some designations of average need and low need, and you'll see our um, district uh, bar graph right on the end there. The needs are actually used um, and defined as a district's ability to meet the needs of its students with local resources, and it's a ratio of the poverty percentages and to the total combined wealth. There are actually very few districts uh, locally and regionally that fall into what's considered to be a low need. Um, noteworthy, those are Orchard Park, East Aurora, and Clarence. So to give you a sense, most other districts, including ours, actually fall into what's considered an average need um, category. So by comparison, as you can see, uh, noting those two bar graphs again, and you'll, you'll see this actually throughout the next several slides uh, and getting next to more grade level specific information here, for example, with ELA, um, you will notice that our district performs on par with the low needs of district. So we often draw this comparison because what this generally means is that um, we are outperforming um, most of the average needs, if not all of the average needs districts, and actually are on par with the, the districts that by and far have uh, generally greater student performance when it comes to these particular assessments. On the next slide, as I mentioned, you'll see the same thing for math again. The two bar graphs um, that are most alike are the low need and the Williamsville graph. Um, particularly noteworthy in mathematics of the 96 districts that are comprised in Western New York, Williamsville was ranked number one again by Business First for the 10th year in a row. Um, so our performance is, is noted in that publication as well. Um, and similar to ELA, which you saw uh, on the previous uh, slides, two slides back, you'll notice again, um, when you look at the green and the blue slides for our math grade level student performance, uh, our data perform very similar um, in nature to what you saw with ELA in that at each grade level, it, our performance is on par um, with what you see the low needs districts uh, happen to be. Just a reminder as we move forward with the math, and again, you'll see um, actually a double layered graph when you see the eighth grade performance is we do not double test our students in math. So our students who are enrolled in algebra one in, in eighth grade only take the Regents exam. They do not take the eighth grade math exam. So the data is always, I like to point it out because it does not look the same as what you see typically at the other levels. The um, percentage of performance looks like it is low until we um, note that the performance does not include our students who are in those uh, in the advanced course. Um, in particular here, uh, what we like to note is sort of a more global um, representation of our data um, relative to New York State and as compared to New York State. So once again, you can clearly see that our performance in both the LA and math when it comes to um, attaining levels three and four, the highest levels of proficiency is that we continue to perform by a pretty wide um, margin, outperform by a, a pretty large margin. Um, New York State. So our data, again, uh, has been very consistent when it comes to that. So as you know, the, the next several slides, and you're, you're familiar with uh, the format of our, our presentation, we've tried to include some comparisons and rankings um, across the board. In this particular instance, we're looking at Erie County. Um, and what you'll notice as you look across the ELA and math is they're very similar to what we've seen. And in this case, you have three years of data actually extrapolated out to include three instead of the two we normally um, show because it is not unusual given that um, a number of districts that are included in the sample set may have a small number of test takers, unlike our district, which has a very large sample. So um, why that's important to note is that the districts with the smaller populations tip typically experience greater fluctuations in their data. So it is not uncommon for this rank order to look like it shifts on any given in any given year. Um, you could be uh, third place one year and you could go down or up um, respectively. For us, we did see uh, quite a bit of st stability across the board um, with our performance and in many cases, uh, for example, grade four ELA, grade five ELA, grade seven ELA, and grade seven math, we actually saw some um, significant gains. The next one here is the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding the standards. Um, again, the same holds true of my commentary that I just made on the prior slide. Um, we do tend to see a greater uh, fluctuation in percentages here. 
Um, I believe you may have recalled from last year's presentation, one of the comments that I made was actually something that was shared with us by New York State in that it was very difficult to compare last year's res results with the prior year. This year, um, New York State has uh, contended that the two tests, this, this past year's and the year before's, are more similar in nature, so they are saying that the tests can, in fact, be compared. Um, one of the variables that we do, do those see is the test takers themselves, unless you are looking from one cohort to another. For example, last year's third graders with the following year's fourth graders, it really is still pretty difficult to make any uh, real comparisons when you're just looking fourth grade as compared to fourth grade. However, again, with that being said, one of the things if we were to look at it in that manner is that we did see increases in grades four and five ELA and grades five, seven, and eight math. So on our next slide, and again, this is formatted similar in nature to um, a couple of the slides that follow. This is color coded for you. So hopefully, I, I know it's a lot of numbers, but hopefully it'll make it a little bit easier to um, read and digest. So uh, just looking at the midsection of the chart, you'll notice in blue is our district performance. The yellow highlights the average need um, piece that I mentioned a few moments ago, and the green bar at the bottom is our low needs districts, which again is more comparable in comparison to what we um, see here in Williamsville. Um, we try to look at, again, um, this information from both a broad perspective, so on a district level, right down to a school level, and certainly the most meaningful level is right down to the student, the student granular level, um, and again, this is one measure uh, of student performance. It's most important when it's in context with other uh, measures, with teachers' observations, and with more longitudinal information than just one test that's given on any given day. So one of the things we do ask the schools to do is certainly take uh, uh, away from this as much as, as can be taken. Um, there is item analysis that is certainly done at the school level. We produce a, a wide array of reports that are used um, by both teams and individuals, and um, certainly there's a great deal of conversation. You'll actually hear more about some of the processes used in um, at the school level and at the district when we present some information on RTI and some of the structures that um, are used at the district level to support students. That presentation will be coming to you in a few months. Um, here, um, in looking at the data and really digging into this level here of testing results, over half of them did increase. We did see some that remained stable. And what we tried to take note of is whether there were any um, large-scale swings, certainly anything in the double digits would be noteworthy to look at. Was there something um, was it something across the board? Was it something at all schools? Was it one particular school? Was it a particular grade level? What was it about the test? Was there something within the test itself? Because you, as you know, we do have um, the ability to see um, uh, a great number of the questions and um, there's an item analysis that also accompanies the report. Um, those are really few and far between. Um, at that point, it really also becomes a very meaningful school conversation um, to see if any of that did in fact occur. So on this next piece, what you'll see here is the middle level representation of this data. Again, um, what was noteworthy here, um, and also I would say uh, this is true of both ELA and math grade five results overall did see an increase. Uh, you will recall back we had pretty significant conversation on how our instructional time was being used at the middle level and seeing that we transitioned students into our middle schools at grade five. We typically saw that this is where we saw um, some challenges, but our data is showing some favorable um, responses to, um, to what we believe that, that shift was intended to um, attain. Um, and here you can see our math. Um, once again, uh, the math did show an increase as well. Um, by the time you get to eighth grade, again, part of the challenges, and you'll note, you know, those seem to really stand out because you see figures in the 30s and, and 20s in some cases that um, are quite concerning and, and, and really uh, deserve some further attention. Um, it has become really difficult to make really heads or tails out of the eighth grade data for math because what we've actually come to learn is there are districts that double test the students. So in the um, data pool here, you actually have a, quite a, a variety of, um, of data. Um, and in some cases, uh, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage, but it's really been our philosophy not to double test the students who are part of that algebra program. And we believe from a student and a learning perspective that that is the right thing to do. So 
Um, getting into science, we actually have uh, several slides for you prepared for science. Our, our data were extremely stable with actually our percentage remaining exactly the same of students meeting or exceeding the standards um, for science. Um, at grade eight, we did see a little bit of uh, a drop. Um, anytime we see this, one of the things we certainly take note of is, again, is this unique to our district? Is it unique to this grade level? How do, how do our data behave when compared, again, to our um, counterparts? And what we've seen um, across the board, and there were several charts and slides that we did not include, but one actually reminded me of uh, one of the ones the auditor used with more of a line graph. We actually plot all of it out to see if anything stands out, and it does appear that our data is very consistent with the behavior of our, um, our regional counterparts specifically. Um, one of the items that I did want to note for you is a, a slide that we added because at um, our eighth grade level, we also have about half of our students who are taking earth science. Um, their performance continues to be extremely strong when it comes to um, meeting or exceeding the standards. So we wanted to make sure that you knew that we were not neglecting uh, that information because it's important that half of our students approximately are taking earth science as eighth graders and that's a, a very, um, very special thing. Uh, the next set of slides, starting first with the district level analysis, includes our regents exams um, and our performance there. Um, just for this larger piece here on a district level, um, across the board with our math, uh, our two algebra and our one uh, geometry, it's noteworthy that all of them increased uh, from last year. Um, our regents ELA remained uh, pretty stable, uh, so did social studies and uh, three of the four region sciences all saw increases as well. Um, here we get into more of a school-based analysis. So you have uh, east followed by north and then followed by south. Um, very happy to report by and far, again, we saw great stability um, in our data um, across the three high schools. Uh, as far as East is concerned, uh, as far as the greatest gain, Earth Science uh, was pretty noteworthy, uh, gaining seven over last year, and that, that I think is worth a, worth a mention. As far as North is concerned, um, again, great stability, math um, across the board increases, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so all of math, ELA, Earth Science, and Chemistry actually saw uh, great increases here. Um, and for South, their largest gains were seen in science with physics and chemistry. You may remember um, the physics piece was actually something we had some pretty um, great discussion about last year. Again, it seemed to stand out relative to some of the other measures, but they had uh, a 12% uh, percent gain uh, for physics and a 16% percent gain for chemistry. So that, that is a fairly noteworthy accomplishment. Getting into the APs, um, you know, it's interesting because I think about when Dr. Marksloff and I first arrived, we had um, quite a bit of conversation with our teachers around APs and um, our teachers were wonderful. It was really um, looking at the um, enrollment in our classes and um, opening our doors up to students who were interested in taking that course. Um, not necessarily for the outcomes, it might have not been for um, a certain achievement level on a test, but really because they were interested in the content and the study of the course. Of course, uh, you know, thinking back to that time, questions arose as to whether or not um, our outcomes would be influenced, uh, you know, and opening our doors to having more students, and actually quite the opposite has happened. We've actually been tracking the information for about the past nine years. Um, so not only have greater numbers of students been taking our tests, and you can see an increase there um, in AP tests taken over last year, um, actually our district mean score has also significantly increased. I actually had to check this number a couple of times just to make sure that we were, um, I, I had not seen it over three uh, in, in uh, I don't know if I've ever seen it over three in quite some time. Um, so last year I reported a 3.33 mean score and this year as you can see a 4.09. So there, our performance is actually strengthening. So I think diversifying our um, our, our classes and getting more students interested and enrolled, they can do it. Part of it's a mindset and a belief. I'm really very proud of our kids and our teachers that um, we are seeing more students come to the classes, but also how well they're they're doing. So I want to certainly thank them for that. Um, here you'll see some information on our diplomas earned. As always, uh, we'd like to have um, students attain uh, 
regions with advanced designation. That's really our, our goal, should they desire that to be their, their pathway and course of study. So um, each and every year we have some pretty significant discussions at um, not only the high school level, but really programmatically, uh, even starting earlier, um, to see what we can do to strengthen our curriculum, to strengthen our um, pathway for kids, and where is it that ch uh, challenges may arise if students are along this path. Um, we also take note of, uh, and uh, wanted to share with you, our um, students with disabilities. Um, three quarters of them are attaining um, at high levels, and there, we have some really strong showing of students with special needs who are, who are also attaining advanced um, diplomas. And I think that's really, um, again, a very noteworthy item because I, I think um, from a program of study perspective, from, again, a mindset perspective, we can't lose sight that when we believe in students, anyone can achieve anything. And I think we've put a lot of um, resources and support in place for all of our kids. And my hope is moving forward and really uh, our plan moving forward is to continue meeting the needs of all students, no matter what your needs are. Um, really, none of this means anything unless we're going to use the information to our um, greatest benefit, which is really to help um, our students move forward. Um, so just uh, one other piece of information, numerically speaking, on the screen, just like you've seen before here, are some of the post-secondary plans of our, our graduates as uh, reported by them. And um, in 2019, um, almost $17 million <coughs> of scholarships, bless you, um, were earned by our students. So wonderful, wonderful news there. Just in closing, a couple of things that, um, uh, again, what we do with the information and uh, some of our programmatic pieces moving forward. Um, one of the items that we continue to put great emphasis on is no matter what information we have at our disposal, it's only as good as what we're going to, going to do when we use it. So any of these data points, anything else that as teachers and principals and administrators and staff members are sitting down is certainly uh, using a process to identify strengths, discussing areas for improvement based on a multitude of information, um, closely examining our programs, our structures, and our resources. Um, you heard a few people mention earlier our professional development. It is always about what more we can do, so we should never rest upon just what we're doing now. Um, and one of the greatest strengths I feel that our district has in addition to the PD that we offer is a facilitation model where districts share with one another, they share with our district staff, and it really is a collaborative process. So we remain uh, with a continued focus on the whole student and meeting uh, student needs, and we will continue to offer and look forward to offering any supports we can uh, to prepare each student for success in school and certainly their life uh, post high school. Um, you will be receiving some additional presentations in the upcoming months and hearing more about some of our uh, programs and our practices. Um, one of these include the Readers and Writers Workshop, which we're looking forward to talking with you more about next month. That has been a significant, really large-scale change, um, not only at elementary, but it's making its way into the middle schools. Um, actually a number of our principals, some of our teachers, and I actually will be leaving myself in a few days to go to New York City, um, and I will be at Teachers College uh, this weekend for the Saturday reunion. Um, very proud of our students, our families, our teachers, everything that's been done under that umbrella, so we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. Um, you've heard about some of our work in uh, the area of science that was delivered to the board by Mr. Bird and some of our teachers. Um, again, that's a continued emphasis because you, you know that implementation is ongoing. Um, in terms of providing supports for students in schools, that's the presentation I mentioned a few moments ago on RTI, the continuum of services, and um, partly, which will also include our special education um, component there. Um, we continue to offer uh, a number of courses where students can earn college credit while they're here. So we're actually getting ready to meet with Damon College. Um, I, we have a planned meeting on Monday to hear about this past summer where over 60 of our students were enrolled at, a, um, at the college itself. Uh, and I, I hear it was a great success, so we're looking forward to that. And we have a, a few new partnerships that we are hoping to um, finalize, so you'll hear more about those hopefully relatively soon. Um, in math, um, you will hear some of our uh, 
program components for the secondary math program. That's another presentation you'll be receiving in the, the upcoming months. Um, we've actually restructured uh, some of the curricular uh, aspects of Algebra 2 and Pre-Calculus um, in hopes that we provide a greater pathway for some of our students to access the Regents exam who may not be currently in a Regents um, level curriculum. Um, I just noted a couple of other things uh, for you that uh, were, were things that we hope to continue, the visiting authors and poets. That was something through our ELA classrooms um, that we did. We continue to hear rave reviews about the students engaging with a poet and writing poetry and doing some wonderful things under that umbrella. Um, there were several parent events that were offered. Uh, you may have heard some names. Uh, Jack Burkmeyer was here with us on opening day. He's actually presented um, some um, presentation to parents uh, at certain schools this year. Um, we have additional parental resources coming in math that we're really um, looking forward to. So there, there's uh, quite a bit here. This is a, a synthesized list, but um, you know, certainly there's always more to be done and always more to come on behalf of our students. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, have any comments that the board may have. Thank you again for the opportunity this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Whelan. Thank if anyone from the board wishes to ask a question or make a comment, Mrs. Deager, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, I have a, I guess a comment and a question. First and foremost, thank you for this extensive report. It's um, nice to see particularly some of the things we were looking at last year and some concerns about just certain courses or things like that, that there's been improvements and um, it's nice to see overall that our students are performing so high. So thank you so much. Um, a lot of those comparisons are really nice to look at too in looking at different regions, so thank you. Um, one of the things you mentioned in the beginning about um, that one measure is something that is most important when we use it in context with other measures, um, and not to discount everything up here, but we know that 100% of our students are not taking mm -hmm. state tests, and I'm really right. speaking more to the three through eight um, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, also, that idea that assessment should be meaningful and allow teachers to make instructional decisions is important. And so I guess my comment is you mentioned that there's upcoming reports, and so not even really for three through eight, but for K through eight, mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in seeing the kind of data that instructional teams may be using to inform instruction and not something that just comes once a year, um, but something that, or, or what teachers might be looking at to uh, gauge how achievement is looking and whether there's gaps or gains um, just at the classroom level, at the district level. Um, so if if some of that could be incorporated into um, some upcoming reports, I'd really be interested in seeing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is kind of a big one and maybe hard to answer, but I still want to ask. <laughs> okay. um, you mentioned supporting the whole child, and I love that Williamsville says that and focuses on that. We've heard uh, from parent feedback and, and surveys and things that it's really important that we focus on the whole child. We just saw this big data presentation, so the question, and it's a hard one, but I think it's important to think about is how do we quantify that we support the whole child in our district? And I'm thinking in particular of um, how we support teachers in this mission. So mm -hmm. as a district, are we pro providing instructional opportunities or expectations around meeting the needs of all learners? Um, and that's kind of a subjective thing, so that's why it's not the nicest question. <laughs> But I think it's important um, to ask how we encourage supporting the whole child with our teachers. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And um, you know, it, in preparing this presentation and working through so much of it is numerically based. I, I think we'd all be remiss if uh, it didn't include uh, a mention and certainly a focus on um, the whole child experience. And actually one of the items that we are uh, building in is what, um, a presentation that uh, Mr. Scanzuzo and I prepared and we're really hoping to build um, off of this. We had the uh, wonderful opportunity to be with Dr. Mertzloff and his uh, community council not too long ago. Um, and we actually built an entire presentation around meeting student needs. It seems like an obvious statement, but the question becomes how are we doing that and what can we do better? Um, and most of that was not academic. <laughs> it was 
it was everything. Um, so it wasn't focused, I should say, specifically on any particular outcomes or numbers or anything of that nature. Um, we hope to uh, enhance that presentation. We got some great feedback. I think it was well received by the group, but they gave some uh, nice commentary too. We've actually uh, shown that to all of our principals. And what we are aiming to do is that that's going to be something that is um, shown and discussed with all of the staff across all of our buildings. Um, the build, the, all building principals were very receptive to doing that. They found the message to be um, an uplifting one, but also a very direct call to action on all of our parts to um, really look at our practices and look at anything. Again, we could do the whole point is really what we can do better and what we can improve upon. Um, we have several um, courses, just so um, um, all of you know, within our course catalog, our two offices have collaborated and actually many of them are delivered by either our own staff or professionals in the community. You notice the list of CTLE approved um, providers that we bring to you um, on this very topic. So, um, and it's multifaceted, so it's not within one area or one discipline, or it's not just for a particular grade level. It can certainly get um, granular enough to do that, but um, it's for all of us. So no matter what our role, whether we're in the classroom, out of the classroom, no matter what our role is in supporting students, it's really looking at those um, particulars and, and always looking to see how they can be approved upon or enhanced. So we're hoping to build some of that into one of the um, future presentations that I mentioned, and thank you for the um, prior um, point that you made that will be certainly part of the, the planning process as well to bring to the board in one of these upcoming opportunities. I look forward to it. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Dr. Benita. Uh, a comment and then a question. Uh, so first, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I'm thrilled to see uh, improvement in the respective areas that we discussed in the past. Um, I guess my question would be, and I'll, I'll try to keep it relatively simple, but obviously uh, during public expression, uh, I heard a resounding uh, information from the community uh, talking about uh, class size. I'd be curious to know um, whether it comes to student achievement outcomes, as well as bridging off of what Mary said about uh, the whole student development, emotional as well, emotional aspects, um, what evidence there is uh, that smaller class sizes mm -hmm. uh, across different ar areas, be it K through eight or even the high school, to what extent that actually results um, from a scientific standpoint in uh, higher uh, outcomes, um, both uh, from a qualitative standpoint as well as a uh, quantitative standpoint as well. I think that's an outstanding question. We would ha be happy to certainly uh, delve into that further. I know, again, uh, recalling back to uh, our arrival in the district when Dr. Marsloff and I were first here, we actually extensively looked at, at that point, what the research to date had uh, uh, reflected around class size, it was very contextual to certain um, um, environments and certain types of districts. Um, but I think it would be interesting to undertake something uh, quite similar in looking at our uh, particular. So thank you for that. I think that's something we can certainly um, look at. Mr. LeMay? First of all, great. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, an immense amount of information to digest. Uh, I know reading through it this weekend, it was, uh, I think I had a smile on my face for most of the weekend. <laughs> Although, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, you know, an avid fan of uh, the state testing and whatnot and the flaws that are associated with them, but it's always nice to see that we're, we're ranking high, especially um, when we're a school district, as you put, that we're rated, uh, according to the state, at the average level, and yet we're pacing right on with the, uh, the, the low standard. So that's, uh, uh, that, that's good to see. Um, my question though is uh and i kind of mentioned it last year and i'm bringing it up again and I, I don't mean to sound repetitious but it's it's still trying to grasp the understanding of where are we uh in preparation of our students our children for the long term mm -hmm. I, I know our goal as a district is to obviously prepare them for college and the after uh the question is is we have no data on what that after is have they um you know are we getting our 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 students, our children through four-year colleges? Are they going off to master's degrees? Are they going on to successful careers? And I know a lot of that information to collect and gather is, is difficult, um, but it, it certainly would be an eye-opener, you know, if, if we think that we're doing a, a tremendous job, and I really believe that we are, to find out that, you know, say more than half of our students dropping out their first year of college. Um, I mean, that would be a huge black eye and, and certainly an eye opener for us to figure out that we've got to change the ways that we're preparing the kids. So 
Um, I don't know that there's really an answer that you can give me on this other than is there a way that we can potentially somehow start generating some of that data so that we can start to reflect on it to see that, you know what, we are doing bread or that maybe there is a weakness. Maybe we're only getting half to two thirds of our kids through a four year and they're dropping out. Um, and that might be a goal to set in future years of how do we fix that or how do we improve it. But until we know that data, I'm kind of a leaving it open, but thank you. Thank you. I, I concur with you on all points. I hope that uh, we will be able to, uh, <coughs> um, what we believe to be true is that we're preparing students right now. There is not a, a mechanism that's uh, widespread enough other than something anecdotally. So I, I <coughs> hope that uh, in the not too distant future that we will have some things at our disposal um, that will actually be able to <coughs> speak to some of the fine points that you made, Mr. LeMay. Any other board members wish to speak on that? I want to say thank you, Dr. Bailey Nagan, for this extensive presentation. Um, I, I'm really happy that our district chooses not to double test mm -hmm. our um, eighth graders who are on the accelerated track for ELA, math, or science. I think that that is um, right there an indicator that we are putting our students' needs over the business first rankings. We're not so much worried with what the outcomes are because we know we're doing what's best for kids. I was always a, an educator and a parent who didn't wasn't really highly in favor of the state assessments. My own children never took them. Um, and I have a college student right now, as does, as does Mr. LeMay, and they do just fine whether they take them or not, in my personal opinion. Um, I do have a question regarding the high school mm -hmm. math. Um, as my kids grew older and got into high school, mm -hmm. and even at open house um, this past uh, last month, in um, I believe it was the Algebra 2 class, the teacher's presentation included a slide that showed a little information to parents regarding the, the state's conversion chart for the cut scores mm -hmm. for Regents exams. And it was alarming for me to see that the raw score is converted to mm -hmm. the actual score that this child receives on the report card. So for the Algebra 2 exam, for example, and I looked this up today, mm -hmm. Um, out of 86 possible points, if um, 26 out of 86 is all they needed to receive a passing percentage of 65, which <coughs> uh, mathematically comes out to about 30%. Mm -hmm. So first of all, is that accurate information? It, it is. Um, I think one noteworthy point across the board is all of these are scaled independently of one another. So that, that becomes where a lot of the difficulty in interpreting exactly, you know, how, how good is good enough, because that seems like a very low bar. So, right. you know, you, we have to aim for mastery or higher, which mo many of our, our students achieve at that level. But one of the points, I mean, you talk to the science teachers, and again, within sciences, you have varying pieces, but just hearing those numbers, it's quite staggering to hear when you, you hear a certain number out of a, a certain number. The, the other fact of the matter is interpreting it. We're, we're very accustomed in our world, and as parents, is looking at things out of 100%. The raw score is not equivalent to a percentage, so that makes it even more um, difficult to um, quantify and interpret because the two are not similar to one another. So we will want to make sure when we present in a few uh, months on our, our program, we will include some information on uh, the test themselves and some of these components so that we share that with all of you and with our, our public at large. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Venator did point out, we did have parents come and speak about class size and um, I especially thank the, the parent that said, and I believe she was a teacher that said, don't forget about or middle school and high school students as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in my son's math class, there's 27 students in that Algebra two class. And I also know that we offer a non-regents um, option, which makes me wonder, both as a parent and educator, why are we offering that if the bar is so low from New York State to pass the exam, why not let them sit for the exam? Because perhaps by eliminating that um, non-regents option for that course, it might help alleviate the class size issue because I, I understand less students sign up for the non-regents class than they would obviously for the 
for the reading since we have such a high number of students receiving reading diplomas and um, advanced reading diplomas, which I think are, is amazing. So I'm just planting that seed. You don't have to comment. I do understand that later in the year there's going to be um, a presentation on mathematics. Mm -hmm. I am also very interested in that RTI presentation because I agree with Mrs. Beeger that um, you know, it, it's, it's excellent to see the results of our New York State assessments. As an educator, that didn't help me reach individual students because those students had already up and gone to the next grade. It did help me go back and do that item analysis by standard so that I could become better mm -hmm. and more effective at teaching particular standards. So for that, there is a strength mm -hmm. to that, and I so appreciate the work and the data talks that happen here in the district regarding that. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just very much looking forward to those two presentations that are coming Thank up. Thank you so here. much. We are The well. academic achievement is very important. One of our speakers spoke tonight about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, it's our number one responsibility mm -hmm. here at the board. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done regarding this. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you. Any other comments on the curriculum presentation? Thank you. There are no personnel matters to discuss at this time. Facility update, capital project timeline. Dr. Mertzbach, would you like to speak on that? Yes, I just uh, mentioned to the board very briefly uh, the capital project that had a focus on the expansion of music instructional facilities in the district is going forward at the state level. And we anticipate uh, getting approval from the state uh, within the next 30 days or so. Uh, which will then lead us uh, to starting our bidding process, which we hope to award by the December board meeting. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Mr. Matursky's office. The information in the board packet regarding that was very clear and easy for me to understand, and I very much appreciated that. Um, it says, see, there are no special needs and student activities matters to discuss. However, does anyone have a request or a matter to discuss under committee of the whole? Thank you. Is there any correspondence anyone wishes to discuss? All right, we will now conduct our second public expression with the same rules as outlined for our first public expression. Anyone wishing to address the board should go to the podium and sign in, please, at this time. We have some diehards here tonight. Does anyone wish to come up and speak again? You're welcome to speak if you'd like. I have the board up here, but it just okay. restate your name for the record. Okay. My good. name is Jennifer Blazak, and I am a high school math teacher. And so looking at those results, and I taught statistics, and so it's just interesting to me. So it would be nice to see, like, the mastery results on that because as the passing rates sometimes for those sure. exams, it would be nice to see the mastery, and hopefully those improve. Thank you so much. Our next board meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 12th at 7 p.m. here at District Office. The com Community Forum will be held on Saturday, November 2nd at North High School. We will have a focus on school safety and security. Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn the regular board meeting? Mrs. Beeger, thank you. Second. Dr. Venator? All in favor? Opposed? Motion abstention? No. Motion carried unanimously. Good night.